Hello, and welcome to episode one of ASMP's Week in Review. My name is Thomas Madry, and I'm general counsel and head of national content and education for ASMP. And we are super glad that you are here, whether you're an ASMP member, interested in ASMP, or never even heard of us at all. We are glad to have you. Uh, ASMP is the American Society of Media Photographers. We've been around for uh, 76 years, uh, fighting for the rights of photographers and supporting photographers in their industry and all visual content creators. Um, a lot of exciting things coming up in this show, as well as many of our other shows at the ASMP Academy. And I can't, uh, I can't express how excited I am uh, to have you here um, as we talk about a few stories that have occurred during the past week that we think are of note. Frankly, things that I find just sort of interesting. So without any further ado, let's talk about some of these, uh, some of these stories. As we get into this program, I want to remind you that we're going to be here almost every week. You know, we'll take a week off here and there for Thanksgiving, Christmas, whatever the case is. Um, but we're going to look at three to five stories each week. Uh, and I'm going to give you my thoughts and opinions on them. Sometimes they'll have a legal aspect. Sometimes they'll uh, be about new gear or equipment. And sometimes they'll just be great articles that we've read. Um, we're really proud and really excited to be partnering with Petapixel on this program. So Petapixel is, as probably all of us know, uh, one of the greatest places online to get up-to-date news and information about the industry uh, for not only photographers, but videographers, all content creators. But there's also some really incredible articles, editorials, opinion pieces on there. And, uh, and we're going to look at a few of those today. Uh, ASMP's partnership with Petapixel uh, is something that we're all incredibly excited about. As we look at each story, uh, you're going to see links. Those links are going to take you to the Petapixel story where you can get more information. And you're going to be able to get all the links plus a lot of background material over at the ASMP Academy. If you're not familiar with the ASMP Academy, it's the members hub and educational center of everything that ASMP does. So we have courses there on copywriting, contracts, and forming your business, and uh, everything in between. But we also have things there like how to find a lawyer, right? We have things there. Uh, we have some classes coming up about NFTs. We have classes coming up about if you're a content creator, how do you work with YouTube? How do you work with social media to protect your work and to monetize your work? Uh, the ASMP Academy is an incredible resource um, and you should definitely go check it out at academy.asmp.org. But uh, the, starting off today, let me just say how excited we are to partner with Petapixel uh, on this show. Uh, and we look forward to a lot of interesting uh, interactions to come. So let's just start, uh, start right in. Today we're going to look at five different stories that occurred uh, in about the past calendar week. Sometimes I might go one day before, one day after, uh, based on things that, that I find super interesting and what we have time for. Um, we're going to first look at Facebook. And Facebook, of course, they changed their name. Uh, we have Meta now, but I'll refer to them as Facebook uh, at this point. Facebook announced that they're shutting down their facial recognition system on their platform. We're going to look at what that exactly means. Uh, there was a really excellent article, a really excellent um, uh, editorial talking about the Kodak Brownie and how the Kodak Brownie affected privacy rights. Now, privacy rights are something that every photographer has to deal with. And there are some really interesting pieces uh, inside this story that I definitely want to highlight. Uh, Jane Goodrich also wrote uh, uh, an incredible article talking about photographers and how photographers are taken advantage of. And she listed seven different uh, ways that this can occur and the platforms this occurs on. I wanted to highlight a few because I think uh, there's some really great points that she makes in that article. We're also going to take a look at uh, an article about a new type of storage, 5D disk storage. Uh, this is 
a new platform that can store up to 500 terabytes for up to 13 billion years uh, is what it's estimated at. Uh, that's just crazy. I don't know that the world will exist in 13 billion years, uh, but your images may uh, based on this new technology. And then finally, we're gonna wrap up with a scam alert. You know, if you're a member of ASMP, you'll get our weekly newsletters. Uh, we'll often highlight scams that are specifically targeting uh, visual creators, photographers, videographers. And we're gonna look at one um, that's been making the rounds lately that I think is really critical. So let's go ahead and just jump right in. Now, at the top of each of the article pages, you're going to see a bit.ly link that's going to take you to the uh, to the story right there on Petapixel so you can get more information. And of course, as I mentioned, if you go to academy.asmp.org and go to the show page for ASMP's Week in Review, uh, you're going to be able to see all the different links that are there, including articles and things that I just found interesting uh, that might supplement the story as well. So. The, the bottom line here is that Facebook has announced that they are going to be removing the facial recognition features uh, from their platform. And so on November 2nd, they made this announcement and they said that there were so many people that had opted into this program that they're going to, when they shut it down, delete all of that information, right? And so, as part of this change, Facebook said, people will have opted in, who have opted into our face recognition setting will no longer be automatically recognized in photos and videos and will delete the facial recognition template used to identify them. I mean, we all know the reach of face Facebook and we know when that facial recognition system pops up, right? You know, you'll see, uh, you'll see people tagged in memories and in photos and across the platform. You may even uh, get noti notifications that, hey, uh, we have identified your face in this image and confirm that this is you, things like that. The numbers of people who use this are incredibly large. So Facebook said, more than a third of Facebook's daily active users have opted in to our face recognition setting and are able to be recognized. And its removal will result in the deletion of more than a billion people's individual facial recognition templates. There's this balance, right? And, and the balance is something that tech companies are grappling with. Of course, in the recent past, Facebook uh, has not had um, the easiest month. Uh, we're, of course, filming this the first week in November in 2021. There's been whistleblowers and congressional hearings and questions about privacy and what Facebook does on its platform. And so this seems to be in response to trying to strike that balance, right? The balance being that every new technology brings with it uh, potential for both benefit and concern, and Facebook wants to find the right balance. That's what they are talking about. So this is interesting to me on a couple of different levels. One, think about the fact that Facebook has a billion people who opted in to uh, have their face be analyzed and recognized and be able to be um, identified in, uh, in photos. That's an incredibly large number and that's an incredibly large set of data. We also see this though on lots of other platforms. You know, we see it on Google Photos, we see it on Apple Photos, we see it in Adobe products where we have facial recognition technology. But here it's a little bit different because Facebook isn't a, uh, a pure photo sharing platform in the same way, uh, in photo storage platform in the same way some of the others I mentioned are. So uh, I think one of the things that really separates this announcement out is just the sheer volume of information. That balance between uh, tech companies and gathering info and individual privacy rights uh, is something that is gonna continue to be in flux. And you know, I think that Facebook here is taking a really big step. I know a number of people who are not photographers who really appreciate uh, this type of technology. And so we have to figure out uh, what, the, what the upshot of this is going to be as it's implemented. 
Um, but that was a pretty big announcement. Um, definitely uh, check out the original story. Check out Facebook's announcement, which we linked to over at the Academy, um, to learn more details about this and how this affects the different products uh, that they offer. Well, one story that dovetails incredibly nicely with the privacy issues raised by what we were just talking about with Facebook is a long in-depth article uh, entitled, How the Kodak Brownie Changed Privacy Rights Forever. I found this to be an incredibly interesting, incredibly detailed article that took some turns I wasn't expecting, got into uh, a number of legal issues, uh, really impressed, really impressed with, uh, um, with the article here by Matt Williams. You know, there are just a couple pieces I wanted to pick out of this article that I thought were particularly relevant. The first is that, in, in general, photography has always challenged privacy rights. You know, photography came along uh, uh, at, at a time and in a way that at each, at each moment when technology advanced, uh, people said, hey, wait a second, right? What we're seeing right now are the privacy rights related to drones. You know, there's these, this idea that, that if people have an expectation to the right of privacy and, and there are certain situations that the courts have held that that occurs. And the question now becomes, well, what if you live in a high rise, right? And what if you're on the top floor and it's, it's no one uh, standing on the ground can get a picture of you, but then one day you see a drone fly up to your window. Is that an invasion of your right of privacy? These are new questions and novel questions, but these aren't the first time that these questions have been asked. Uh, and the article makes a very strong case about how the Kodak Brownie was really one of the, the, the sea change moments um, that introduced this idea of the right of privacy. You know, when we talk about the right of privacy, and the article mentions this, uh, lawyers and legal scholars often look back to a Harvard Law Review article from 1890 entitled The Right to Privacy uh, by Samuel Warren and, uh, and Louis Brandis. And, you know, I, th this article is an exceptionally interesting read if uh, you want to see some of the foundations that even recent court cases have, um, have been built on in relation to privacy. And uh, we've linked to that over at the ASMP Academy uh, um, when you go to this course page. But the Kodak Brownie was, uh, was, the, was the camera that brought photography in many ways to the masses. And when you democratize the ability for people to take photographs, you also increase the ability for people to intrude on rights of privacy. So uh, the article says, the explosion of images was inexorably linked to an explosion of intrusions, new and strange to the culture. The public could not get enough of the brownie and their sense of propriety began to relax in order to accommodate their new fascination. I think that's a really interesting point. The idea that simply the introduction of one camera versus another um, uh, and how that camera uh, affected not only an individual's idea of what privacy is about, but society's idea as a whole um, on what was appropriate and what was allowed when it comes to intrusion into a personal sphere, right? You have to imagine that before photography, you could make a drawing or a painting of someone, but certainly it didn't have the, uh, the immediacy and the realism that photography brought. Um, for a lot more on that type of, uh, that type of analysis, uh, I strongly recommend reading Susan Sontag's book on photography, which I think is an exceptional, um, an exceptional uh, work. Uh, one that we're going to be diving into in a couple other uh, facets over at the ASMP Academy as we, uh, as we add new and exciting courses. Um, this article also talks about something that I found really interesting uh, because it's come up in the news lately. And that is the courts were finding that 
photography was not an invasion of privacy in a lot of cases. And this upset people in the various states. So in 1903, New York became the first state to recognize the right to control the use of one's name and image. Well, look, now we're talking about rights that you very well may be familiar with as we're sitting here, rights like the right of publicity and the right to privacy in relation to photography and who is in the works. Now, of course, those rights, unlike a right like copyright, those rights are state-based rights. So here you see New York in 1903 introduced a, a name and likeness statute. Uh, and uh, almost every other state, I think every other state to some degree or another, has introduced those as well. So I think what you find uh, and what I found after reading this article is that the Kodak Brownie really brought about this, this change that from the 1870s to the 1920s, there was a lot of things going on in the law. There were a lot of things that were taking place that affected this idea of the right to privacy. And drawing a line between that core right to privacy uh, in the courts and photography is something that I hadn't thought a lot about. And I think this article is exceptional and you should definitely go take a look at it. The next story I want to take a look at is an excellent thought-provoking piece by Jane Goodrich called Photographers Are Taken Advantage Of and Enough Is Enough. And no matter what type of work you create, I think that parts of this uh, article will resonate with you. Um, there are parts that talk about uh, photo sharing platforms. There are parts that talk about technology platforms. but I wanted to highlight a few quotes that I thought were particularly interesting and particularly relevant to so many things that uh, creators face today. Um, is she, the premise of the article is that photography is the series of, of changes that have occurred. And as she writes, the photography industry constantly shifts as technology continuously advances. Photographers have shown resilience, creativity, and brilliance in adapting to changes in our industry. And yet our needs to feed our families and earn a livable wage have been neglected. I think for any photographer um, who is out there trying to make a living, you, uh, you, you see yourself in that, in that quote. Um, it, is, it has always been hard to make a living as an artist, to make a living as a photographer, as a creator. And it's only getting harder each and every year. And she goes on to list seven different things that have occurred um, that kind of came after this, this shift from film to digital. She talks about the film to digital shift as kind of a, an inflection point where, as she says, ultimately many photographers adjusted to and even embraced the change, but new technology means new ways for photographers to get shortchanged and exploited. And the rest of the article goes on to explain some of those ways. I just wanted to pick two of the seven that I found particularly interesting. She talks about stock sites, and this is something I think a lot of us can relate to. I was a, a photographer um, before I ever went to law school, a commercial and fine art photographer, and, and I sold work on, on stock platforms. And back then, stock was a viable option um, for photographers to uh, to to have a stream of income and to make a career out of. Many of my uh, colleagues were stock photographers. Um, they worked closely with their editors and, uh, and created work periodically throughout the year. And it was a, uh, if not lucrative, but steady stream of income. But then MicroStock came along and other options um, uh, became far more prevalent this idea of, of royalty-free works um, went from something that was tangential and, and uh, less common to something uh, now we see just a proliferation of, uh, of, of works that cost nothing out there. Um, as, as Jane writes, photographers on stock sites earn an average of two cents a month per photo. Yes, two pennies. Let's say you price a full-time living at 4,000 per month 
to earn a full-time living selling stock photos for two pennies monthly, you'd have to upload about 200,000 images and you'd have to upload dozens or hundreds the next month and the month after that. Um, that is some sobering and incredible, uh, incredible statistics. There are links uh, in the article at Petapixel that um, you can follow to see, um, uh, to see the sources where uh, Jane got her information. But I think that it, it raises the broader point. And the broader point is that stock is, and has not been for a long time, a viable way for the vast majority of creators to, um, to earn a living, whereas it used to be. Now, this is another shift. And as she writes, photographers have been resilient and creative in working with those shifts and dealing with those shifts, but it is a shift nonetheless. It also, and, and this is now my editorializing, um, it also contributes to the devaluation of uh, photography and, and creative works in general uh, on the internet, which is something that we have to fight about quite a bit at ASMP. Many of the, uh, the, the advocacy efforts and the efforts in the courts around the country that, uh, that we undertake are based around this idea of, of devaluing, uh, devaluing works. And I think uh, microstock in, in many ways has, um, has contributed to that. Now, that isn't to say that there aren't um, decent stock sites out there that have more photographer friendly um, rules uh, and policies, uh, but those are fewer and further between. She also highlights something that I found uh, not only really interesting, but particularly relevant, and that is social media and bad advice. Uh, as she writes, photographers don't have an easy way to calculate what to charge and many severely underprice themselves. The prevalence of wrong information on social media certainly doesn't help. Social media also makes it easier for inexperienced photographers to steal work from others and claim it as their own. This practice sometimes lends false credibility to their uninformed opinions and advice. Look, this is probably one of, of my biggest pet peeves, right? Because you have uh, people who have platforms now and megaphones uh, to, to say whatever they want to say. And um, in many cases, as I look online at different photography forums and different Facebook groups and um, the different places photographers gather, uh, there are a number of things happening. A lot of times there's a race to the bottom on price. You know, a client says, well, I'm looking at a photographer to do this. And, and photographers who have made a living and who have been around a while will say, well, this is the cost of that. Um, other photographers will, will quickly undercut that. Uh, and it is, like I said, a race to the bottom. But more importantly, and this happens especially on pricing matters and especially on legal matters, more importantly, are people who are convinced that they are correct about something and they are actually incorrect. This is where working with organizations like ASMP, uh, who have been around quite a while, um, is worthwhile. Because the number of times that I have gone onto uh, a Facebook group or an internet site and said, hey, look, uh, what you're saying about copyright, what you're saying about contracts just is factually wrong. And it is so wrong that I have to jump in here and talk about it. And, um, you know, that's where being part of an association really makes a difference. So you can get up to date information that you know is correct. But I think this proliferation of misinformation on social media, which we've seen obviously in many other realms besides uh, creative and, and visual works, um, is, is pervasive and concerning. And her point about devaluing work and devaluing what photographers do is particularly, um, uh, particularly poignant. Uh, I think that um, based on the different uh, photographers that I get to speak with around the country, one underlying theme is that almost universally, no matter what level you're at, almost universally photographers do undervalue their work and undervalue themselves. Um, charge less than they necessarily should. And that hurts the whole industry, right? 
that hurts the whole industry. So uh, definitely check out some of the um, some of the resources if you're an ASMP member uh, about pricing and your business and uh, how to develop the the true cost of, of your business um, over at the ASMP Academy. Uh, I thought this article was was um, exceptionally on point uh, and something that every uh, creator should read. Moving on to something that's slightly less serious uh, than privacy rights and legal issues and, uh, and technology companies and devaluing work. Uh, this is just an article that I thought was, was uh, kind of interesting, and, and that's uh, new 5D disk storage can store 500 terabytes of data for 13 billion years. Uh, University of Southampton in the UK Researchers say they developed a fast and energy efficient laser writing method that can produce high density nanostructures in silica glass. I am absolutely sure that it can do everything that I just said, and I would have no idea how to even start thinking about how to do those things. Now, of course, nanostructures are tiny, but it is just a huge amount of information. They say that these tiny structures can be used for the long-term storage of five-dimensional optical data that is 10,000 times denser than the optical disk storage technology used for Blu-rays. Now, if, you were, if you've been around quite a while and remember when uh, uh, we were burning images for backup to archival gold CD-ROMs and we had our 750 megabytes and when Blu-ray came out, it was such a a leap, uh, a leap forward. And now we're looking at something that has an information density of 10,000 times more uh, than even a Blu-ray. That is something interesting. My question though was what is 5D? I mean, I, you know, 5D is a, a, a concept that I haven't spent a lot of time ever thinking about. Um, so one of the, uh, the researchers says the new method encompasses two optical dimensions plus three spatial dimensions, hence the 5D name. Again, I'll, uh, I'll, take, uh, I'll take his word for it. Um, and then high temperatures at a long time. So as noted uh, by Engadget, and of course there are links to, uh, to the Engadget article as well, this type of storage medium could withstand temperatures up to 1,000 degrees Celsius and last 13.8 billion years at room temperature without degrading. Um, you know, sometimes when I talk about copyright, I talk about the fact that your copyright lasts the creator's life plus 70 years here in the US, right? Creator's life plus 70 years. And uh, people uh, will often ask, well, what, what good is, is my copyright after I'm gone? Well, of course, copyright, like any other asset, can be put in a will or it can be gifted or it can be sold. It's an asset, right? It's intellectual property. Uh, but the same question might be asked here, which is, what good uh, is a storage medium that holds my photographs 13 billion years after I am gone? Uh, and I will leave it up to you uh, to answer that question. The last article I want to touch on today is uh, kind of an alert, a warning for photographers out there. Photographers are often the subject of scams. Uh, this scam is one that is uh, intricate and detailed and not necessarily easy to spot. Um, and so definitely wanted to make sure that, uh, that you are aware of it. Um, uh, Frederick Trotovin, a Danish street photographer who's based in Mexico City, uh, experienced this scam. And uh, um, the scam starts with an email. And the email uh, uh, purportedly comes from uh, uh, Nat Geo photographer Enrique Sala, um, who for whatever reason uh, has been the uh, subject of these scams. Of course, he is not involved at all. Uh, but a lot of scams name check him, uh, so much so that if you go onto his uh, page at Nat Geo, uh, there's a disclaimer that says if you've gotten an email purportedly uh, to be um, from, uh, from Enrique Sala, uh, it is not him. <laughs> uh, it is a scam. So this email talks about a couple of different things, but it starts with, 
I have my team for field work, but I'm in need of a professional photographer, videographer to complete it. I thought you might be interested in being part of my research team. The field work of this research starts on September 11, 2021 for seven days in Iceland. Well, a lot of times when we see scams, that's kind of where where things end. You know, you have this initial email and, and maybe the email's written well and you respond, but this went really deep. Um, you know, if Nat Geo calls you up as a photographer and it's the type of work that, that you might do and, you know, that's, that's not something that you necessarily, uh, that's something exciting. Um, but here, Sala then sent, uh, and fake Sala, right, certainly um, the person purporting to be Sala, uh, sent an itinerary for the seven-day shoot with details down to hourly time slots. Uh, there were conversations about budgets and there were conversations about contracts. But then at the very end, there was another email. And that email said, your details are well received, but the only challenging factor right now is your location. I'm so sorry, but I thought you were currently based in the United States. Professionals outside the United States are to pay a commitment registration fee of $850 or its equivalent to be part of the National Geographic Research Team. Of course, that's not true, right? This whole thing isn't true. That, that's not true. No, no part of this is, is accurate. But if you had gone back and forth on, on uh, this scam with these scammers and you had gotten hourly itineraries and a whole bunch of details and things seemed to be legitimate, right at the very end is when they try to get money from you. Now, this is one of those things that I definitely always encourage, uh, I always encourage photographers to be on the lookout for. We see this a lot. We see different types of scams targeting photographers, uh, especially uh, in the editorial world, the commercial world. You get a email purportedly from, uh, uh, from an art director, from an editorial director, and they say, I need you for a shoot here, and this type of thing. Um, over at ASMP, uh, when we start getting complaints and, and we see those come in, we'll put scam alerts in our newsletter um, that goes out every week so that uh, members can be aware of some of these things. When I see a scam that is particularly, um, particularly relevant, um, I will highlight it here on ASMP's Week in Review as well. You know, I really want to thank you for being a part of, uh, of this first episode, taking a look at uh, ASMP's Week in Review, episode number one. Can't uh, express uh, enough how excited we are to launch this, this show and this project with Petapixel. Uh, definitely check out all of the links uh, that are in this slideshow. If you're a ASMP member, you can go to uh, academy.asmp.org. You can see all the different information. I pulled the Harvard Law Review article uh, from uh, uh, 1890 that we referenced about the right of privacy. Uh, I pulled a number of different things uh, to supplement even the works um, that the great authors at Petapixel uh, did in the last week. Uh, we will be back uh, next Thursday, next Friday, uh, to take a look back at what happened uh, in, in the next seven days. Uh, until then, my name is Tom Madry. Uh, this has been a show from the ASMP Academy uh, that is powered by, um, by the great people over at Petapixel and the amazing writing there. So thank you. Have a great day, and we'll talk soon.